so, so, so uh, uh, let's remember what we were discussing before our long break. Uh, we were discussing uh, uh, n equals one, four-dimensional n equals one supersymmetric QCD uh, with NF chiral fundamentals and NF antichiral fundamentals. Remember, we needed the same number of chiral and antichiral fundamentals in order that the gauge gauge group, so that the gauge group not be anomalous. Okay, and uh, we were uh, the question we were posing ourselves. We posed. You know, following Cyborg, we pose the following question. What is the low energy dynamics of this theory? Okay. Um, let us remember that our, our chiral multiplets were phi, which, we, whose expansion including, included a fermion, psi. The superfield expansion included this. There was a phi tilde, whose superfield expansion in, included theta psi tilde. So psi and psi tilde are the uh, fermions for phi and phi tilde. And there was also um, a gauge multiplet uh, whose first term for W alpha included this, uh, the gauge eno lambda alpha. Okay, these were the three uh, fermionic fields of the problem. And for purposes of anomalies, they're the, um, you know, the most important fields. Um, of course, if we want from, um, you know, no, knowing the, R charges and so on of these, we can deduce the R charges of the scalars if we want. Okay. Um, in particular, uh, the R charges of the scalar phi and psi tilde would be minus n by nf plus one, because psi and psi tilde had one lower R charge than the, than the scalar field. Okay, um, great. So um, there were two or three things about our, so when NF was less than NC, we understood in the previous lectures the, uh, the dynamic, low energy dynamics of this theory. Um, the low energy dynamics of this theory generated a superpotential for, uh, for the chiral multiplets. Uh, the superpotential was this Affleck-Dine Cyberg superpotential here, where you remember that M was phi phi tilde, the gauge, gauge invariant contraction with phi phi tilde. Right, the meson superfield. Um, we got this, and then uh, we went through last time the argument that if you added a mass, the uh, um, if you added a mass to this uh, uh, to, to this theory, uh, we just add uh, uh, a trace m m to the superpotential. Okay, excellent. Um, there are two or three things I wanted to uh, add to our discussion from last time. We said some of these things, but, uh, but two or three things uh, I wanted to add to our discussion from last time before uh, um, uh, before continuing. Is, is yes. M M is like a, that M was a M minus. Little M was a constant matrix. Oh, a constant matrix. Constant matrix yes. with constant numbers. Yes, M I J. Yes. And capital M was a meson superfield. So it's like M and A have the same indices, and they are product, and then you prove the. It's matrix multiplication. So M I J M J I. Okay. Um, so there are one or two things I wanted to uh, uh, add to this to our discussion from last time before we we proceed. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to tell you what is the expected behavior of a pure QCD, your pure supersymmetric QCD in uh, uh, four dimensions. So what we expect, okay, first, once again, this analysis helps us understand, you know, all, anal uh, everything about anomalies. So in pure supersymmetric QCD, what are the symmetries? Well, these SUNF, SUNF, U1, U1 don't exist because they acted on the matter fields and pure supersymmetric QCD, there are no matter fields. So the only potential symmetry in the game was UNR, okay? But you remember that we uh, uh, computed the anomaly of this naive U1R symmetry. Okay, and you remember we computed the anomaly of this naive U1R symmetry. We found that del mu j mu was equal to uh, number times f wedge f. Okay, um, uh, number times um, times f wedge f. Uh, where f 
is the background gauge field coupling to this U1R symmetry. Okay, and uh, um, and uh, uh, the contribution of the anomaly from a, uh, um, uh, from an adjoint field. Okay, the co uh, the contribution to this. Um, uh, sorry, sorry. F was the um, uh, F was the field strength of the S uh, SU gauge field, right? S was the field strength of the SU gauge field, the dynamical gauge field. Uh, we were computing this mixed anomaly, which was J gauge gauge gauge, uh, global gauge gauge. Okay, and uh, uh, so F was the field strength of the SUN uh, of uh, of the SUN gauge group, and uh, uh, after we normalized by the what a 32 pi square, whatever is the normalization needed to make the integral of this integrally quantized. We found that we got the contribution um, to NC from the adjoint field. You remember we went through these anomaly calculations, adjoint field calculated, uh, contributed 2n times more than the fundamental field. Okay, and uh, um, uh, this now since um, right. Yeah. Do, you, do you remember we went through this calculation? We had this two NC here. Then we had a minus two NF when we had the uh, fundamental fields. The minus came from the fact that uh, the uh, uh, the size transformed under mi with minus one under U one R under the naive U1R, as compared to the gauge nose, which was plus. Uh, the 2NF came from the fact that there were two kinds of size, size and size tildes. And, uh, and uh, uh, the relative factor came from the fact that adjoint contributed 2NC times more than, than fundamental. Is this clear? So had there been just one fundamental quantity, in units in which you got 2NC for the, uh, for the adjoint, you would have got minus one for the, for the fundamental quantities. But there aren't one fundamental quantity, there are two NF fundamental quantities. Because there are NF size and NF size tilde. That's why we got the two NF, uh, NC minus, two NC minus two NF. Okay? But now we're in the pure gauge theory. So the, in the pure gauge theory, this, uh, this relationship here was just two NC. So just a special case of the analysis we did last time. Okay. Now, uh, we can ask the following, okay. Um, in fact, for this, for exactly this part, let me add the NF as well. So I'll work in the general theory and uh, specialize later to the, uh, to the uh, pure, uh, pure gauge theory. So we have this two times NC minus NF. So you see, this relationship tells us that this U1, uh, this naive U1 R symmetry is anomalous. But you can ask, is it completely anomalous? Okay, is it completely anomalous? Or is there some subgroup of this U1R symmetry that is preserved under the anomaly? Okay, now, this relationship, if you take this relationship and integrate it over a region of space time, it tells you that this charge is not conserved in an instant on background. So charge final minus initial, these, these guys are far away, so they, they don't contribute. Charge final minus initial is given by the integral of this over the space-time uh, space world volume. We've normalized this guy so that its integral is always in integers. Okay? So what we find here is that Charge is violated, charge conservation is violated, but it's violated by 2NC minus 2NF uh, times an integer. Okay? Now, let me call this um, NC minus NF, let me call it some N prime, so that I don't have to keep saying in the pure gauge theory, n prime will be the same as nc. So it's violated by 2n prime times an integer. 
Okay? Now, this is not the most general violation of charge. The most general violation of charge conservation would be violation by an integer. Okay? Now, let us remember how charge conservation comes about from symmetries. Okay? Suppose I've got some correlation function, phi 1 to phi n, such that this guy has charge q1, this guy has charge qn. Okay? What that means is that under a, under a charge rotation, this guy translates like e to the power i alpha q1, this guy translates like e to the power i alpha q2, rotates, rotates not translates, and then e to the power i alpha qn. Okay? So the charge rotation, okay, the charge rotation um, uh, acts by phasing this correlation function, acts by phasing this correlation function, okay, um, um, uh, with e to the power i alpha q1 plus up q2 up to qn. Okay, so charge is being conserved and arbitrary rotations being a symmetry of all correlation functions are basically the same statement. Okay, now we have seen that charges are in general not conserved. But they are violated that sum over Q's can't be anything. It's 2n prime times an integer. So now notice that if alpha was not an arbitrary phase, but 2 pi i divided by 2n prime. Then this rotation would still conserve the co correlation function. Because the sum over q that appears there is um, 2n prime times an integer. So the 2n primes would cancel, we get 2 pi i times an integer, and the correlator would still be conserved. Okay, there's another way of saying it, uh, uh, talking about how uh, um, the measure of the, the action changes under, under an anomalous uh, sym symmetry. It, it, uh, uh, it changes the measure by f wedge f times 2 pi i times this alpha times this number. Okay. And once again, if alpha is uh, integer by, by, uh, by 2n, the 2n, 2n cancel. And so the action only changes by an overall phase. Okay, these are the same statements. Okay, so what we have deduced from here is that even though this theory is anomalous, the U1 symmetry is not conserved. Maybe I'll keep. Fine, let's, let's finish it. Anyway. The U1 symmetry is not conserved. It's not completely broken. We have U1 is anomalous, is broken down to Z to NC. Uh, two, two n prime, what I said. Two n prime. Okay, this u one is broken down to z two n prime, uh, and in the pure gauge theory that we were talking about just now, is equal to z two n c. Is this clear? Okay. So, this the R symmetry of the pure gauge theory is anomalous, but not all of it is anomalous. There's a discrete subgroup. The Z to NC. Yes, this is a subgroup because it's a particular rotation. Any rotation is a subgroup. Is a, yeah, any group of rotations is a subgroup of U1. Is this clear? Now, um, what is believed to be true, and we've already made contact with this in our earlier lectures, but I thought I would give you 10 minutes about the basic phenomenon. What is believed to be true is that in, and maybe you can, in some ways, the cyborg story, if you buy it, confirms this conjecture. What is believed to be true is that the Gaginos, Gagino bilinears condense. Gagino bilinears condense in the vacuum of n equals 1 supersymmetric QCD. Very much like it's believed that in the vacuum of ordinary QCD, quark bilinears condense. Okay, breaking chiral symmetry to just, you know, a diagonal part. 
Okay? So what is believed to be true is this, that we have a condensate of lambda lambda. Okay, these are chiral guys, so there's an alpha, there's a beta here, and then there's an epsilon alpha beta. So it's a Lorentz invariant. Okay, there's a condensate of uh, lambda lambda filling the QCD vacuum, very much like in, a, in the real world, as we said, we have these bilinears of uh, quarks in the QCD vacuum. This is believed to be true. Now, um, if this is true, then what can we say about the number that could, could, could appear here? Okay. If this is true, the only number that could appear here is lambda cube. Well, lambda is lambda QCD. Right? Just by dimensions. Because gay genomes have dimension uh, 3 by 2, because they're fermions. So the only scale that appear, can, could, could appear there, uh, just by engineering dimensional analysis, is lambda QCD cube. Okay. And, uh, however, if we think about this now a little more, you see, because um, lambda was a field that was charge one under this R symmetry. Right? If you look at our table, I'll pull that table back for you, but lambda was this field that was charge one under this R symmetry. This you remember, we don't need the table for that. Okay, so lambda lambda is a field that's charged 2 under the R symmetry. Now, Z2n, Z2nc acts on charge 2 fields like Znc. Because the phase is doubled. So instead of getting e to the power 2 pi i by 2, uh, integer by 2n, on these fields you get e to the power 2 pi i integer, uh, integer by n. Okay? So what, what, what's going on here is this, that um, you've got this charge 2 field that preserves a Z2 subgroup of Z2NC. But it's charged, you know, think of Z2NC as having a Z2 times Znc subgroup. Okay? So Z2 times Znc subgroup. Okay? Now, uh, in fact, Z2NC is Z2 times Znc, said, said in the proper way. Now, this field is invariant under Z2, but is charged under the Znc. Now, so if you've got a field that has an expectation value under a preserved symmetry, then by acting with that preserved symmetry in the vacuum, by acting with that preserved symmetry, we, should, we must be able to generate another vacuum. Okay? So if it's true that the vacuum of um, uh, pure U, uh, pure SU, uh, pure gauge, N equals 1 pure gauge theory, does have this condensate of uh, uh, gauge bilinears, then it must be true that there are NC degenerate vacuum. This is just a consequence of spontaneous symmetry breaking. Let me say it in other words. Our theory had a Z2 NC uh, preserved, genuine symmetry. Okay? The vacuum breaks this Z2 NC symmetry down to Z2. Z2 is actually genuinely preserved by the vacuum. So the Lagrangian had a Z2 NC symmetry. The vacuum, we believe, preserves only a Z2 subgroup of that. Therefore, by the Goldstone phenomenon, the discrete Goldstone phenomenon, there must be to a, a NC such vacuum. How are these vacua related? Well, they're related by phasing of the quark of this quark condensate. Okay. So, in the nth vacuum, should be e to the power 2 pi i n divided by nc. Okay, this must be true. Now, there's just, uh, there's another way of saying it, which let me just say for completeness. Louder. It's, I was now, it would be n prime in general. I'm now talking just about the pure gauge theory, therefore nc. Okay, yes. Uh, 
both different. Uh, no. Uh, the lambdas are the same, so you can't do both different. It's the by rotation by e to the power 2 pi i n by 2. And fine. Right? So that's the rotation by which is e to the power pi i. Just lambda goes to minus lambda. Right? There's a particular rotation, namely the one with the integer n c. Which just makes lambda minus lambda. And clearly that preserves this. So that's Yes. What happens to the other terms? The other terms. Uh, uh, what happens to the other terms? Um, let's see. So, um, you know, if the f term in, for instance, if the theta square term in the superfield had an expectation value, supersymmetry would be broken. Exactly. Right. So, just this term has the expectation value. This is the only, certainly the fermions don't have an expectation value. Because that would violate Lorentz invariance. And you might worry about the f term. That also doesn't have an expectation value because that's, you know, uh, that's the thing for which you write down a superpotential. So this is the only term that has the expectation value. We had this discussion, right? This, this yeah. does not violate supersymmetry. Yeah. 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 Why was that 2NC broken to Z2? Uh, from this. So let's, let's look at this. What was Z2NC? Z2NC was the group in which lambda goes to e to the power i, 2 pi i, m divided by 2NC, where m is any integer lying between 0 and NC minus, 2NC minus 1. Okay? Now let's see how, how this acts on the condensate. We have to square it because there are two lambdas here. So what we get is lambda cube goes to lambda cube times e to the power 2 pi i m by 2 n c square. And so which is equal to lambda cube e to the power 2 pi i by n c uh, m. Okay. Now, let us take the special case m is equal to nc. <coughs> For this special, or in, in general, let us uh, take the, the, the case, yeah, let's take the special case m is equal to nc. This does not act on this thing, this is just one. So it's a particular rotation that leaves this condensate, the vacuum, unchanged. Therefore, it preserves a vacuum. Okay? More generally, if we act with m is equal to nc plus m prime, that's exactly the same as acting with m prime. Okay? So, what we see is that if we think of this group as z2 times zn, zn are just the rotations with uh, e to the power 2 pi i m by 2 nc where m lies between 0 and n minus, nc minus 1. And z2 is just the rotation with that same thing with m is equal to nc. We see you can build any z2 nc rotation by products of these. So the gauge, this z2 nc was zn times z2. We see the z2 element is preserved, but the znc is broken. Is this clear, Anura? Okay, excellent. Huh. Excellent. So, uh, uh, fine. Sorry. So let's go back to uh, where we were. We, 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 we are rewriting that equation. So we had lambda lambda, I'm not writing the indices now, is equal to uh, uh, lambda cube times e to the power 2 pi i n divided by nc. Okay. Now, let's look at this from another point of view just for satisfaction. Okay. Um, uh, the other point of view to look at this from is by rewriting this lambda in terms of the bare scale 
and the cutoff at the base scale. Right? So this is the kind, the kind of exercise we've, um, uh, we've gone through many times. Right? So we have lambda cube is equal to lambda not cube. And now I never get the sign right, but let me try. e to the power uh, minus 1 by, uh, I'm not going to try to get the 2 pi's right also. A, there's some 8 pi g squared or something, 2 pi, whatever, whatever the, the standard number is. Um, um, now, is, have I got the sign right? Just a minute. Um, so, as g goes to, this is lambda naught. Right? As g naught goes to 0, this becomes very small, compensating for, that, for the fact that this becomes very big. So, that's correct. It's asymptotic freedom. I can't remember, it's probably 8 pi. It's some number, just this, the correct number in this formula. Okay, the, uh, the thing, now, number you get by solving the beta function, uh, by solving the beta function equations. Okay. Um, now, you see that this, um, oh, uh, right, exactly. Now you see that this relationship here, by adding this phase to, um, to this guy, is effectively shifting 1 by g squared. Okay, so in fact, uh, wh what is the usual combination? Uh, uh, the, 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 forgive me, 2 pi's, we'd have to get the 2 pi's right. But it's effectively shifting 1 by g squared. But shifting 1, so 1 by g squared is going to 1 by g squared uh, plus, I'm writing these 2 pi's anyway, but uh, 2 pi i n divided by nc. And as you know, in supersymmetric notation, if you take tau, if you take 1 by g squared, goes the, the full supersymmetric coupling is over the 1 by g squared plus i times theta. Where theta is the theta angle for QCD. So what this is doing is effectively shifting the theta angle by 2 pi divided by nc. But that's exactly what we said should happen under a, an anomalous change of measure. Do you remember? That was our second argument for why this... Uh, why z to nc should be preserved, because under a z alpha transformation, the effective measure in the QCD path, path integral changes by 2nc times alpha times f wedge f. So effectively shifts, shifts theta by 2nc. So that is the full symmetry, if we change theta, theta also. Theta also, of course not really a symmetry, because it's changing a parameter in your theory. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You could make it an artificial symmetry by shifting yeah. theta as well, okay? So what we expected that when we did such a rotation, theta would shift by theta plus two, uh, plus, uh, um, remember we're rotating by double the minimum, okay? So, uh, so, uh, so, um, uh, so theta would shift by theta plus this business. Okay? And that's exactly what we're seeing happening here with the 1 by g squared. Right? The right combination is 1 by g squared plus i times theta with the right 2 pi's. So the shift in phase is basically the shift in theta that we see from our, uh, from our symmetry. Is this clear? So this is another way of seeing that this is what we should have expected in this vacuum. Because the vacuum expectation value was proportion was e to the power min minus 1 by g squared. 
But you know, everything's holomorphic. So it actually was e to the power 1 by g squared plus i theta. And by performing the anomalous symmetry, that effectively shifts theta, explaining the space. Is this clear? OK. So, um, as Oh, absolutely. Once you know what g squared is, so let, let's, let's, let me, I've said this tw uh, twice, but let me write it in an equation. Let's normalize theta such that theta is 2 pi periodic. Theta is the same as theta plus 2 pi. Okay? With this normalization, the under, if you have del mu j mu, is equal to 2nc times f by jf, where this is normalized to be unit integer. I mean, this is normalized such that its integral is always in, in, uh, uh, integer quantized. OK, then with such a normalization, theta goes to theta plus under the chiral rotation e to the power i alpha lambda. Say lambda goes to e to the power i alpha lambda. Theta goes to theta plus alpha times 2n. See. Hmm. Okay? And therefore, this is a very particular normalization of this, uh, of this theta. Okay? So, this preserved symmetry, ah, maybe the confusion is between Ah, I, I missed the key thing, right? There was an NC here. Maybe that was the reason for the confusion. Sorry. This preserved symmetry is a preserved symmetry because it preserves shifts of theta. Because it's, it, 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 uh, sh when alpha is our form, alpha equals 2m uh, by NC times 2 pi. This thing is shifted by an integer multiple of 2 pi. Of, of two pi. Okay? So theta itself is just shifted by integer multiple of 2 pi. But what appears here is 1 over nc times g square. Okay? And therefore, it shifts by an extra factor of 1 over nc. Maybe 2 over nc. I can't. We have to get that factor right. Okay? And therefore, it shifts the vacuum expectation value. Okay? So the shift in theta under the symmetry, even though it was 2 pi integer under preserved symmetries, is not an integer if you take some fractional power of e to the power 1 by g squared. But the fractional power is what appears because the beta function contains nc. And this, this is, in fact, just the fact that uh, the Toft coupling appears, right? g squared nc in the beta function. Okay? So this was the second way of seeing that this was a reasonable thing to happen. Is, is this clear? Okay. It's just, I haven't tried to work out all the numbers for you. Like That would require keeping track of these beta function coefficients carefully and so on. You can go that, do that or you can look at There'll be 100 reviews that will, will work out these numbers. Is the logic clear though? Okay? Great. Okay. So, um, uh, I wanted to tell you about this because in the last class we explained, um, we, 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 if you remember, we did the following check. We took all the quarks and gave them a large mass. And uh, uh, then we solved the equations of motion. And we found that there was uh, an effective superpotential. Right? We found that, that uh, uh, the term which we were multiplying with d2 theta and that, you know, that term, that term was non-zero. And then we identified that with W alpha, W alpha of the low energy theory. Okay? We found that when we put in the factors of M, what we got was effectively lambda cube of the effective low energy theory. Do you remember? We had lambda of the high energy theory, and then some factor of determinant of m, and that coupled together into lambda cube of the effective low energy theory. 
and we identify that with Gagino condensation. Okay, uh, so, uh, so I wanted to give you just a little background about this Gagino condensation and uh, the general expectations about uh, about uh, uh, supersymmetric UCD. And so, if you buy this identification of the superpotential here is coming from Gagino condensation, in some sense, it's a derivation. These two facts are tightly related. So the fact that this affleck dein cyberg superpotential implies, you know, if we're generous, implies Gagino condensation in the pure theory with a computable number for the Gagino condensate in terms of the number behind the affleck dein cyberg superpotential. You know, so uh, affleck dein cyberg and Gagino condensation are sort of joined at the hip. Okay, uh, we can play a, a more elaborate version of this game at NF not, you know, without massing out all the quarks, but I won't bother to do that. Thing. Okay, uh, any questions or comments about this? Also, can you understand uh, developing a mass gap kind of Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the, uh, see, suppose there was not a mass gap. Let me ask the f this question first. Let me ask, can we, suppose we take QCD and we mass out all the quarks. We take QCD with the quarks and mass out all the quarks. This is closely related to your question. Because at low energies, this thing should be just now pure QCD because all the quarks have been massed out. Okay, can we understand this thing developing a, a, a mass gap? Okay, now suppose the gluons were massless. So that the theory was uh, um, uh, was not um, uh, not ma uh, did not have a mass gap. Then what which, what should we expect? What normally happens if you try to write down a low energy effective action for some modes, ignoring the fact that in addition to these modes, there are massless modes in the problem. What normally happens then? is that the low energy effective action becomes singular for these modes. The singularity as a consequence would be cured once you integrate out the massless modes. So integrating out the massless modes always gives you a singularity. And this will compensate for the, the bare singularity of these low energy effective modes. This is the usual story. The fact that we got smooth behavior without a singularity is sort of an indication that there were no massless modes we missed out. You see, we were trying to write down an effective description without including anything from the gluonic sector. Okay, that's rough way of saying it. It's not completely convincing, I know. It'll become a little more convincing, Diksha, when we look at situations where this does not happen. Okay, so uh, uh, as you will see, there will be situations, as you know, there will be situations where the gl gluons don't develop a mass gap, and in that situation, we will not be able to write down a, a smooth superpotential. Okay, and we will see a little bit of this, this happening, but not not hundred percent convincing, but somehow it all fits together. Uh, I was asking if there is some supersymmetry argument that there is a Gagino condensation, Gagino uh, mm. mm. Okay. I don't know of a supersymmetry argument like this, but let me, since this question has come up, let me recall um, the general relationship expected in any theory uh, between, uh, uh, in fact, there are theorems about this in lattice gauge theory, between, uh, condensa uh, gauge, uh, between condensation uh, of fermions and uh, um, a confinement. Uh, I'll recall that there is a theorem, but just in order to remember the theorem, it's nice to think of it in terms of a string theory picture. So let me just give you that picture and we can, we can reconstruct that. Okay. Um, there is this construction of, uh, um, con you know, consider the following thing. Consider, um, mm, mm, mm. 
Let's suppose we were doing Witten's version of uh, confining gauge theory from ADS safety. Okay, uh, the actual constructions happen in slightly more elaborate context. These are the, uh, these Japanese guys. Um, Sakai Sugimoto construction. Sakai Sugimoto is actually what I want to say. But I'm going to give you a baby version of this. Okay, so remember Witten's construction of confining, a confining four-dimensional vacuum. It's by starting with um, four-dimensional, let's say five-dimensional Yangmill theory and putting that theory on a circle. The circle is supersymmetry breaking. The uh, fermions have anti-periodic boundary conditions. Okay, so ignoring all details in ADS CFT, the dual to this is like a cigar. How do we know that? We know that because um, this is the same as putting this work in Euclidean space. The circle is the same as putting it at finite temperature. Finite temperature produces a black brain, and that black brain is a cigar. Okay? Now, in string theory constructions, if you want to add flavor, what you do is add some additional brains. In this case, it would be some lower dimensional brain. Now, uh, at some point, let's say in this case, it would be a four brain. You don't actually do this because it doesn't preserve supersymmetry. That's why Sakai and Sugimoto work with three brains and seven brains. But the same ideas is present. Okay, you add um, uh, some brains on this, on this thing. And you know, brains, you add brains here and anti-brains. Okay, now there are two kinds of geometries that you could have. If you look at this in Lorentzian space, Okay, so uh, fine. So this is a background of the theory. Now let's look at this in Lorentzian space. Okay, in Lorentzian space, this is just goes down the black hole. Let me say it more right, more correctly. Sorry. In Lorentzian space, first, if we add time to this problem, okay, make this the time circle. And make this the space, bar, space circle. Now there are two possible geometries in this game. One in which this guy caps off. This was the one in which this guy capped off and this time circle just remained non-contractible. That is the confining vacuum. Because as you go lower down, at all times, space ends. Okay? Whereas th there was a geometry where you could have this guy capping off. Okay, that would be finite temperature behavior where you could actually go into the horizon when you go down this circle. Is this clear? Okay, I'm saying it very roughly, but please, it's not clear, I'll say it in more detail. So please tell me, is it clear? Uh, no argument yet, I'm giving you the scenario. Argument's coming, but uh, see, suppose I've got a torus in Euclidean space. And I want to look at fillings out in Euclidean space of the torus. Either you can have this cycle becoming contractible or this cycle becoming contractible. Suppose I have this cycle becoming contractible and I continue this in time, uh, make this circle time. Okay? Then that is a cycle in which space ends at all time. It's like global ADS. Right? In this brain context, it would, be a, uh, it would be a configuration in which as you go down the radial direction, at some point space ends because some cycle, namely a circle, shrinks off. So it's really a spatial cigar. Clear? On the other hand, suppose this guy was the contractible guy. Okay, now I go to, uh, to Lorentzian time. This guy here, being contractible in Euclidean time just tells you you had a black hole. Okay, so as you go down in the radial direction, space doesn't end, you go through a horizon. Okay, so there are these two different configurations. Okay, now, this is the configuration that is associated with confinement. Okay, because it has space ending, so you get a mass gap in your theory. You solve the Laplace equation, and it will come in discrete modes, because space ends. 
Space ends here because ADS is a box. Space ends here because you've got a cap. Okay, like global ADS has discrete spectrum. Okay, this is the the, the one where you've got black hole is the deconfined phase because black holes are deconfined. Gas of gluons. Okay, so there's this nice correspondence between uh, between these two geometries, confinement and in this case, of course, finite temperature, but doesn't matter. Deconfinement. Okay. Now, as I said, how do you put flavor into this game? You put flavor by adding some brains here. Okay, you add some brains here and some anti-brains here. Let's say I added n brains here, I'll get some SUN. Now, I add n anti-brains, you'll get some SUN. Symmetry because of the brains and the anti-brains going and hitting. Now, there are two kinds of configurations for this brain. One kind of configuration is that the brains go and go, go through the horizon. And the anti-brains go and go through the horizon. In such a configuration, the brains and anti-brains have nothing to do with each other. And so the symmetry of the theory is what you put in, namely SUN times SUN. But there's another configuration, one in which these guys, one in which these guys meet up. The brains become the anti-brains. In this theory, the brains and the anti-brains are Related to each other, clearly there's no ro rotation here without a rotation here. So in this background, SUN times SUN, this is all flavor, huh? is broken to SUNF, very much like what happens in QCD. Is this clear? Now, notice that the background in which Chiral symmetry is broken, can happen in either of the phases. Right? Because brains can go and meet up whether or not there exists a horizon. But the configuration in which chiral symmetry is preserved can only happen in the deconfined phase. Because if there's no horizon, the brains have to meet up. Where, where, where do they go? So there is a one-way implication between these two phenomena. Okay? If you know that chiral symmetry is preserved, at least in a large class of models, you know the theory is not, not confined, is deconfined. But if you know that chiral symmetry is broken, at least in this class of models, it could be that the, th that the theory was confined or deconfined. Okay? Uh, all this can be done in a supersymmetric context. Okay? So I don't believe that supersymmetry can, can, can give you the implication you want. Okay? The relation, the implication f uh, fr from this, this lovely picture uh, is very general. In fact, people in lattice gauge theory prove theorems that say this that it's impossible to have uh, chiral symmetry, uh, that if you are deconfined, sorry, if your uh, uh, chiral symmetry is preserved, it's impossible then to be confined. Yeah. You know, the, the one that's correct, people in certain context. So I don't exactly know the answer to your question, Diksha, but I suspect that no more than this is true. In general. Hmm. Okay, uh, good. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Um, if you're interested in looking this up, there is, you know, the papers of Sagai and, Sakai and Sugi, Sugimoto. And I think there was this, uh, maybe Aharoni made this point that there was, Aharoni and Kutasov made the point, that, well, this one-way implication. There was a paper on this, I can't exactly remember. In this model. Okay. But let's keep going. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so in that case, let us uh, now continue to uh, study, please. So the point there was that under this physical side symmetry, yes. Theta angle is the radius by integer of Foucault. Yes. I mean, e to the action doesn't change. Yes. But, yes. but the condensate lambda will change. Yes. Lambda cube, you see, lambda to like 3 nc or maybe 6 nc 
will be proportional to theta e to the power i theta normalized such that it's 2 pi periodic. So that will change the vacuum expectation. That will change the vacuum expectation value because our, our, our thing was not lambda to the power 3 nc, or maybe 6 nc, I can't remember. Yeah. But it was lambda cube. So it will change. Is this clear? Okay, excellent. So now we want to move away from, we want to now graduate past NF less than NC. We want to graduate to NF, the next most, the next case as we climb up the ladder, which is NF equals NC. Okay, now right at the beginning of the consideration of these cyber theories, we proved to ourselves that in the case NF is equal to NC, it's impossible to have a superpotential. And I'll remind you of the proof. So when NF was equal to NC, the naive R symmetry was non-anomalous, as you see from this. As you see from this, I can't remember. We have this equation, right? Del mu j mu is equal to 2nc minus 2nf. It's there on the top. Excellent. Okay, so when we have nf equals nc, this is zero. So the naive R symmetry is non-anomalous. Okay, but phi and phi tilde, the bosonic fields, were uncharged under naive R symmetry. Therefore, it's impossible to make any superpotential out of phi and phi tilde that carry charge two under R symmetry, as is needed for a superpotential because of the d2 theta. So no matter what we do, if we're only going to use phi and phi tilde, there's nothing we can do to make a superpotential. Is this clear? This is a very simple argument, the argument we started this discussion with. Okay, it doesn't use any details. So in this case, we have no superpotential. Okay? And you might think, therefore, and it's true, that we're going to have a moduli space of vacuum. Because if we have no superpotential, then there is nothing telling you where M should be. But let's study this in a little more detail. Hmm. You remember we understood, okay, that there were these nice gauge invariant, that, that, that we could solve the F and D term constraints in terms of these, these, ga uh, these diagonal type configurations, okay, for Q I alpha and Q tilde J beta. Okay, you remember that there the was that up to gauge and global symmetry, the F and D top constraints had this unique solution. We went through this last time. Okay, now in these, now that we've gone to NF equals NC, there's one new element that comes about, and that is that there is a new gauge invariant, uh, new gauge invariant uh, superfield we can write down. The new gauge invariant superfield is B which is equal to epsilon I1 to I, I N, NF or NC, that's just one, I call it N, Q um, I1, Q I N, um, and uh, alpha 1 to alpha N, epsilon alpha 1 to alpha N. Right, these were bosonic fields, so they had to be bosonic under interchange of any two fields under both indices. This guy had an epsilon from gauge invariance. That's what we're doing. We're trying to make a baryon. We're trying to make a gauge invariance such that instead of having index of Q with the index of Q tilde contracted, we're having the gauge epsilon contract the gauge indices. But then because of the symmetric nature, 
in order that it be symmetric under interchange, we needed this epsilon as well. Okay, so there's only one such field. It's a unique such field. It's B. And there's a similar guy out of the Q tildes. Okay, so there's B tilde. So there's this guy. This is another gauge invariant uh, uh, chiral superfield in terms of which ph physics can happen. Okay, now, if we were trying to write down superpotentials, we should wor work in terms of these guys. But we already know beforehand. There's no chance of writing down a superpotential. Right? Because anything made out of Q and Q tildes cannot work. Because Q and Q tildes are just uncharged under R symmetry. just won't work. Now, all these guys are uncharged under R symmetry, right? M is uncharged under R symmetry, B is uncharged, B tilde is uncharged, superpotential won't work. But let's look at these M fields and B fields a little more. Yeah. What do you mean? It has a gauge index and a flavor index. Thank you. That's what you meant? Thank you. Yes. Oh, maybe I'll go down here. Oh, that makes a difference. Now you can ask yourself, of these chiral superfields that we see, are they independent of each other? Or is there some relationship between them? Okay? Now, when we take our standard configuration of, uh, of uh, uh, quark expectation values, what was the baryon? B was simply, okay, if we had our standard configuration big alpha 1 to alpha n, B was simply, uh, was simply equal to alpha 1 to times alpha n. Can you see this? It's effectively like the determinant of this matrix two alphas on that Q alpha beta. Is this clear? If you take M i j, you p multiply N of those and you put epsilons in both of them up to some N factorial that's the determinant of the matrix. In fact, it is N factorial times determinant. Right? So this guy up to N factorials, which I'm not keeping track of. Okay? Is, uh, maybe I should divide my B by an N factorial. Okay? Is alpha 1 to alpha n. Similarly, B tilde will be alpha 1 tilde to alpha n tilde. Remember that Mij was equal to delta Ij times alpha I, alpha tilde j. Obviously, because we're just dotting the gauge indices. But gauge matches flavor. So if you have M11, for instance, it had in that uh, configuration, only the one index triggered in gauge, because gauge and flavor were diagonal in our standard configuration. Gauge matches gauge, and therefore one matches one. Okay, and you get alpha one, alpha tilde one. Is this clear? Shall I say it in more detail? Okay, and so now you look at these and you see that classically, we get a nice relationship. The relationship is that the determinant of M is equal to BB tilde. Classically, we have this relationship. So instead of introducing two new gauge invariant operators in the game, effectively, classically, we see we've introduced only one. Right? Because there's B, there's B tilde, but there's one relationship between that and the old gauge invariant operators, namely the M's. Right? Now. It's a general rule in physics that if you have, well, I mean, it's not a theorem, but usually what happens in physics is if you have a classical relationship, you have something true classically, quantum mechanics can 
change it, but it won't destroy it. It's not like you have a relationship in classical physics that has no analog in the quantum theory. That almost never happens. So you can ask the following question. A, is this relationship, does this relationship violate that rule? Which would be very strange. Or is this relationship just preserved in the quantum theory? Or maybe it's modified. Okay, which of these possibilities, if any, is correct? Okay, so let's look to see. The first thing I want to see is, I, I, I want you to notice this. This is especially for Diksha. Um, notice that on this manifold of gauge invariant operators, there is a singular point. And that singular point is M is equal to B is equal to B tilde is equal to zero. Okay, this, that, this is singular. You know, it's this, if you try to geometrically visualize this thing, it's some sort of cone with a tip at this singular point. Okay, uh, it's, right, it's a little like X, Y is equal to uh, something. When that something is zero, we have either x is equal to zero or y is equal to zero. And these two meet at a, at a singular place, right? So, so either if the right hand side determinant of m is equal to m is equal to zero, then b and b tilde come and meet in some either this is zero or that is zero. Clearly at both equal zero, it's not a manifold. Okay. So this manifold of gauge invariant operators has, has a singularity at m is equal to b is equal to zero. Now, what is the cause of the singularity in classical physics? The cause of the singularity in classical physics is simply the following. When all our vacuum expectation values are zero, all of the gauge symmetry is preserved. Classically, therefore, all the gauge bosons are massless. Okay, because the gauge bosons are massless, you expect something funny to happen if you work in terms of a description that's, that does not include them. Okay, and indeed, this quantity here has a singularity. In, in fact, it's more general. Um, if even one of the guys is non-zero, okay, if, if, uh, uh, let's say we have a configuration where two of the A's are, are non-zero, but the rest are zero. Okay. Now your gauge group will be broken down from SUN to SUN minus two. Still you've got massless degrees of freedom. And still we have the singularity because the determinant of M vanishes. So the same argument gives you. You know, so everywhere where we have massless degrees of freedom, okay, this manifold at those points develops a singularity classically in accord with this general intuition we were discussing 10 minutes ago, okay? Now you can ask the following question. Is the singularity preserved quantum mechanically? So look at the style of the question. We've got this manifold of different vacuum. The manifold cannot be lifted because we cannot generate a super potential. So there's going to be a manifold of vacuum. Now, even classically, at a generic point on the manifold of vacuum, we had a mass gap because the gate group was completely higgs down to nothing. However, classically, there was a place in this moduli space of vacuum, a point in this moduli space of vacuum, or lo locuses, special locations in this moduli space of vacuum, okay, where we did not have this mass gap, and that gave rise to the singular relationship between uh, that we believe, because there's no proof, but the intuition is that this is what gave rise to the uh, singular, uh, singular nature of the manifold of, uh, in terms of these gauge invariant variables. Question, does the manifold of vacua continue to remain singular quantum mechanically? This is a proxy for the question. I mean, of course, using a lot of intuition. But uh, it's a reasonable statement that this is a proxy for the question. Is there a point in the moduli space of vacua where the theory continues to have massless gluons or not? You see, at a generic point, even the classical theory didn't have massless gluons. So it will not be true in the quantum theory. 
But there was a special point in uh, lo special loci in the classical theory where we had massless gluons. At those loci, this manifold of vacua became singular. Question, is this singularity resolved quantum mechanically? Sounds like the question of whether the theory has a vacuum which has massless gluons. OK? So this is the question we're going to try to answer. First, I'm going to give you the claim. The claim is that it, there is no point where there are massless gluons. OK? That the singularity is quantum mechanically resolved. And in fact, the correct manifold is det m minus b b tilde is equal to lambda QCD to the part 2 n. Okay. Now, um, um, some uh, immediate consistency checks about this claim. When all quarks have large expectation values compared to lambda QCD, then our theory is effectively weakly coupled because the gauge group is higgsed before it has a chance to flow to strong coupling. Right? At scales above lambda QCD, gauge theory is weakly coupled. Stays, scales below it, near or below it, it's strongly coupled. If you higgs out your theory at scales much larger than lambda QCD, then the theory is necessarily strongly coupled, uh, weakly coupled at all scales. Because the gauge bosons have masses much larger than lambda QCD, so before the chance, you know, before the theory has the chance to, to run, the theory has become masked out, gapped. So all physical excitations are weakly coupled. Okay? So if we take our debt M and the baryons, we take all the A's and make them very large compared to lambda QCD then we'd better go back to the classical result because the theory is weakly coupled. But if we take M and B and B tilde very large compared to lambda QCD, then we can ignore the lambda QCD on the right hand side. And we've re returned to our classical result. So this, this, this claim passes that immediate check that where classical physics should be correct, we get the classical answer. Okay? Um, but there are two, okay. But there are two much more non-trivial checks of this claim. Okay. There are two much more non-trivial checks of this claim, which I'm now going to try to explain to you. I'm going to first explain to you the, the intermediate check. The first thing I just said was necessary, but it's, you know, qualitative. Now let's try to make this more quantitative. Suppose this is true. You see, what happens at nf is equal to nc is not independent of what happens at nf is equal to, let's say, nc minus 1. As we've, as we've seen, there's a way of going between them by, by adding a mass for the quark. Okay? So suppose I take my theory to nf equals nc and take the nf quark and give it a mass. Okay. So I've taken my nf quark and I've given it a mass. So I've added m, some little m. Q, N, F, I'll call it, yeah, yeah, let, let's just call it L, F. Q, N, F, Q tilde, N, F, gauge contracted as my super potential. You see, symmetries, um, symmetries forbade us from adding a term if we're preserving the symmetries. But if we just add a term to the classical Lagrangian that violates symmetries, of course we can add it. And this is what we're doing. We're just adding this term to the classical Lagrangian. Nobody can stop us from doing that, just like we did for NF less than it. Okay? So we've added the superpotential term now. And this is our superpotential. There's not much more to say about it. This is our superpotential. However, this superpotential, we can now write this as m times m nf nf. 
because that's what MNFNF is, QQ tilde. Okay, this superpotential is this object, and um, uh, now suppose in addition to this we add an MIJ, MIJ, where IJ runs over indices that are not equal to NF. Imagine that MNF is much larger than the MIJs. So now we have a, a flow so that at scales below M, we've gone to the theory with NF minus one quarks. And that theory with NF minus one quarks now has its ma a mass matrix, this little MIJ. Okay? In this situation, we, sh we know what we should expect. Because we should, we've returned to a case which we understand well. So let's see if what we expect, let's see if what we expect um, is, um, uh, let's see if what we expect matches, somehow manages to match this deformation. That's, that's the game we're playing. Okay. So let's see. First, what should we expect? Let's look at the affleck dein cyberg superpotential in the case, case NC is equal to, uh, NF is equal to NC minus 1. So in this case, W effective was equal to lambda by det M. Okay. Plus M, Mij, Mij. Mji, what this? Fine. Whatever. Let's say Mij. Right? This is what, what we should ex ex expect, except what's lambda? Lambda was related, so let's call this lambda uv or lambda nc. Lambda was related, uh, this lambda here was related to the lambda of the high energy theory by the matching relations we de derived last time. Okay? And uh, uh, wait, have I got this right? Was this to some power? Three NF minus NC? Three NC minus well, Let me look at this up. Three NC minus NF. Three NC minus NF. Okay. Now, last time we worked out the matching relations. Uh, uh, could, could someone remember? Can someone recall them? When we added a mass, what was the matching relation? Presumably it was lambda. Okay, we can figure it out, right? Because uh, uh, by adding a mass, we're reducing NF by one. So it should be that lambda three N C minus NF, uh, this is lambda NF, is equal to lambda NF minus one to the power three NC minus NF plus one, NF minus one. Um, but this has now one extra lambda, so I suppose with an M. Can somebody confirm this, please? Uh, no, no, I'm saying in general. Suppose we. The question I'm asking is this. Suppose I take NC uh, colors and NF flavors, and I add a mass for one of the, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, quarks. Okay, we effectively go to a low energy theory with only NF minus one flavors. Okay, so this is lambda NF minus one for that effective low energy theory. And uh, did, was this the relationship we derived last time? Some Uh, minus two. Are you sure that that was not for Higgsing? Yeah, this is for Higgsing. 
uh, look at for adding a mass. I think this is correct. It's dimensionally right. I sort of remember it. We worked it out logically last time, right? but I'm not going to go through that again. OK, so now we'll satisfy Kanu, because what were the two theories? There was NF was, so in the, in the case of at hand, there was lambda NC, and then this is 2NC times mass is equal to lambda NC minus 1 uh, to the power uh, 2NC plus 1. Right? Okay, so this is the matching relationship we're supposed to use. This here was lambda NC minus 1. And this should have been 2NC plus 1. Right, because I wrote it wrong. And so we're supposed to replace that. So W effective is equal to M times lambda NC. Three to the power two NC divided by that M plus Mij Mij. All good? Okay. What? What do you mean? No, no. Yeah. This debt M is M of only NF minus 1 times NF minus 1. This is now in the theory. In the theory, NF is equal to NC minus 1. This M is this M. The one with IJ indices. Only the, clear? It's in the low energy theory. Okay. Now, let us actually try to go ahead and solve for what M becomes in this low energy theory. So we do that by varying this low energy superpotential with respect to the meson superfield. Okay, so let's do that. So del W effective by del Mij. Okay, well, let me vary. So let me just write delta W effective. Okay, is equal to M lambda nc to the part 2 nc times debt m square times the variation of uh, determinant of m which is um, delta m i j m inverse uh, i j times debt m Right, because the minor for the ijth element and the inverse of the ijth element are uh, inverse ij are related by a factor of debt. Right? So plus mij, varying this part, uh, delta mij. Okay? So this is equal to delta M Mij into M lambda Nc to the part 2 Nc divided by debt M, okay, uh, plus M inverse Ij debt M. Oh, sorry, no debt M. Mm. Plus Mij. What? Multiply. Thank you. Okay, if we want the variation for to vanish, this thing has to vanish. Okay, I missed a minus sign here. There was a minus, right? This thing has to vanish. 
and uh, so we see that m inverse ij its matrix structure has to be proportional to mij okay and then some number to make it work right so clearly we have m inverse is m or equivalently m ij is equal to m inverse ij times some factor of determinant that will make this whole thing work okay so we now i'll let you guys find the factor of determinant i'll trust cyber has done it right and let me write it down so cyborg finds mij is equal to m times lambda to the power this is uh yeah the effective guy here so what was that that was lambda and c to the power uh 2nc mm. to the power 1 by nc and then m inverse ij small m inverse ij no this is what we want we want to express big m in terms of small m sorry the first small m was what a, was the mass of the nth quark that is not a matrix it's a number uh, and the second small m is an nf times nf matrix sorry for the bad notation no no that is the last element that is the last yeah the whole quark matrix would be m mij okay clear okay now by the way hmm uh by the way there's a sort of side remark i wanted to make the side remark is see that we have to take the 1 by nc th power now when you take 1 by nc th power there is a phase that is ambiguous by by the nc th roots of unity and this of course connects with the fact that because we masked out everything we are assuming m inverse has a has a it is well defined which means every quark has a mass because we masked out everything the low energy theory is pure qcd you remember it had nc different vacua okay so these roots this 1 by nth the 1 by nc has some ambiguous space that phase maps to the number of different vacua you expect okay excellent but that's not the focus of what we want this is just a side remark to connect with what we were talking about at the beginning of the class uh, that's not the focus of what we want to do now yes yes um if we started with a uh, number of flavors um different from nc and no i think we always in fact cyber has given the un answer for general nf and nc uh so uh okay let's look let's look suppose we were just doing this affleck dine cyber super protection just here okay um well, let's work it out since you 
since you brought it up. What will the equation be? Um, the equation would be sort of complicated, right? Um, but let's work it out. Um, the equation will be that uh, I'm ignoring this lambda because we don't care about that, right? <laughs> when we solve what power? So the equation will be 1 over uh, debt m to the power 1 by nc minus nf plus 1. And then there'll be a debt f in m in the variation. So we will have this times um, delta m times, uh, what did we have last time? M, m, m inverse. OK. M inverse uh, is equal to M. That will be the, the, the thing we'll have to solve. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, so let's let's solve that. Uh, so clearly, as we as as this was M inverse, and this was M. So clearly, as we said before, M has to be proportional, is alpha times M inverse. And now I'm go going to plug this in to see how it works. Okay. So if M is alpha times M inverse, uh, then uh, I'm just plugging this in. So M inverse is equal to 1 by alpha times m m inverse is 1 by alpha times m so we will get uh, and debt m is uh, um, debt m will have what power of alpha will have alpha to the power n uh, nf right alpha to the power nf, so debt, debt m, m is equal to alpha to the power nf divided by debt m. Okay, so now uh, we want to uh, put left, so LHS is 1 over alpha to the power nf by nc minus nf. Um, uh, and then there is an m inverse here. Um, so that's w into 1 by alpha times m. Um, so we need alpha and as you said into 1 by debt m to the power 1 over nc minus nf. Debt no. m, little m, yes, you're right. Uh, debt uh, m to the power 1 by nc minus nf. OK. Uh, the m's have cancelled. And so we have debt m to the power 1 by nc minus nf times uh, alpha to the power, now add this 1. So that's nc minus nf, ah, so that's nc by nc minus nf uh, is equal to 1. Okay. And therefore, now raise the whole thing to nc minus n. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been a disaster if that had happened. Because we know that the, or we strongly believe that the vacuum of uh, pure QCD has nc vacuum. It would have been really a disaster of that. It would have, I think, would have said that this whole thing was wrong. Right. What? In this case, yes. 
So, so, so right now the algebra that we were doing was just starting from this formula, <coughs> forgetting about how it came from, <coughs> from the earlier thing. Okay, but now we'll just scrap this algebra. We'll just scrap this algebra so we don't confuse ourselves and go back to that formula. It's just the same thing, except that the effective value of lambda to the power, instead of lambda to the power 2nc plus 1, we have m times lambda to the power 2nc. Just the same thing. But just, yeah. Okay. So where was our, oh, where was the formula we wanted? Here, there, that was the formula we wanted. Let's go back here now. Okay, so the relation, uh, the quantity we had was that minus m um, lambda to the power uh, uh, lambda nc to 2nc uh, by that m uh, was equal to m. And then I gave you a solution. I can't even remember where I gave you the solution, but let's, oh, just to be safe, let's just work it out. Once again. What, what? Capital what? Ah, uh, this was uh, uh, M inverse, yes. Okay, let's just work it out so we know that M is equal to uh, M. Let's just do exactly what we did before. M inverse times alpha and just put it in. So we get minus, so we, this is with a plus now. The same formula, I just want to get it straight in terms of these two guys. Yeah, uh, last time I didn't keep track of this, right? Okay, so I get m times lambda to the power nc, to the power 2nc. Um, now this is alpha to the power nc. Uh, times debt m. Let me call this m tilde to differentiate between the matrix and the uh, scalar quantity. I'm sorry for this. Let, in one minute, we'll finish. But if you take that as a constant, then we'll be calculating. Yes. You will get that. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. If somebody has a, knows the, can just tell me the answer, we get it. That's it. Uh, yeah, or I'll work it out. Uh, this uh, times m inverse, right? So this is equal to one. This is the relationship we have. Do you agree? And therefore, alpha. Uh, where was that coming from? Oh, from here. So plus one. plus one, correct, thank you. And so we get alpha is equal to m tilde lambda nc to the power two nc debt m uh, to the power one over nc plus one. Okay, excellent. And so our final formula is that uh, m was equal to m tilde lambda to the power nc, lambda nc to nc debt m um, One. Have I messed up here? Yeah? 
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this should be just NC, right? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it should, should have been 1 by NC. OK, all good? Yeah. Um, I think this is what I wrote down right at the beginning. Uh, beginning also. OK, thank you. OK, so now we've got this nice formula. OK. And now, uh, let us compute on this formula the determinant of this quantity. Um, the determinant. Is the NP like a part of the determinant? Of which determinant, sorry? M tilde is just the mass. First element of the mass. No, this is not part of this. This was the low energy guy, right? Right. Um, yeah. And now what I what I, what I want to compute is this. So I've, I've got this this formula for um, for the M. This is Mij. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I want to check that this result is consistent with um, the deformation. Mm, give me one minute. Hmm. I think the best way to proceed is to now compute the superpotential. Okay, so I've got this M inverse, and let us remember what the superpotential was. Right, the superpotential was M lambda to the power 2 NC to the power 2 NC divided by delta M. Okay. So let me compute the determinant of this M. Okay. So, can't hear you. Plus Mij, plus Mij, capital Mij. Uh, plus Mij, capital Mij. Uh, correct. Plus Mij, capital Mij. And I will eventually. They will be competing terms, yes. And let's see what we get. Okay. So we take this and we compute this. Uh, this let's on shell we'll compute the superpotential. Okay. So det m is equal to um, uh, is equal to. Uh, 1 by det m, and then this thing is raised to the power nc plus 1, right? nc minus 1. m tilde lambda nc to nc det m to the power nc minus 1 by nc. OK. So, now I compute the whole guy. 
I compute the whole guy, so I get m lambda to the power 2 nc to nc divided by this quantity. So divided by, this was m tilde, m tilde lambda to the power nc to the, lambda nc to the power 2 nc that m to the power nc minus 1 by nc. Uh, and then a debt m here. And that m tilde was inside here. Excellent. So it, which, is e, which is equal to, thank you. Uh, m tilde lambda nc to the power 2 nc that m to the power 1 by nc. That's what you said, right, Kanu? Thank you. And let's compu uh, compute also the other term. Uh, that's the same thing as what we got because uh, we had this quantity, uh, m cancels the n. So just with a factor of 2, right? Uh, uh, two times this. Okay, excellent. So our result is the following. Our result is that the superpotential was equal to 2 m tilde lambda nc to the power 2 nc that, that little m to the power 1 by nc. But in the upper theory, we knew that the, we know that the superpotential was just um, m tilde times m nf nf. So the value of the superpotential in the UV theory was m tilde m n, uh, nf nf. But we've calculated what the value of the superpotential is in the IR theory. These two should be the same. Okay, and so this gives us a formula for what m nf nf is. Okay. So the formula is that um, m nf nf is equal to um, 2 by m tilde um, lambda nc to the power 2 nc m tilde det m to the power 1 by nc. This was a determinant of the n cross n, uh, nf minus nc minus 1 cross nc minus 1 mass matrix, right? No, no, that's just the coefficient of the mass term. That this, it's this m tilde. Right, I'm sorry if I'm messing up in the algebra, please help me people. Okay. Okay. Now, now that I have this, I can now compute determinant of the big M. Okay, the big M, which was M NF NF and this M, the M we've been dealing with. Okay, which is just this into determinant of the M that we've been talking about. Okay. So determinant of big M determinant of the big M is equal to 2 by M tilde times M tilde lambda NC to the power 2 NC times det M to the 1 by NC, that's this, uh, times that quantity which was 
m tilde lambda to the part lambda n c to the part 2 n c det m to the part n c minus 1 by n c divide by data and it just becomes 1 yes thank you kan yes so we get up to the strange factor of 2 which i may have messed up on somewhere so we get um um m tilde as kanu said this just combines to this bracket to the power 1 so we get m tilde lambda to the power nc uh, sorry lambda nc to the power 2 nc det m and det m cancels m tilde and tilde cancels okay I'm not sure if I got the two right. Maybe the relationship should have been det m tilde minus bb tilde is equal to two times. Okay. But you see, we verified something quite striking. We verified some, some, something quite striking. The striking thing we verified is this. Okay. That by going down to the low energy, by going down to the low energy thing, we were able to compute what the expectation values of all the low energy quark uh, meson were. If, um, however, then by equating the superpotentials, we were also able to compute what the expectation value of the high energy super high energy quark was, high energy meson was. Thereby, we were able to compute the determinant of the full high energy m. Notice we had many parameters in the game. We had little m tilde, we had this mass matrix m, m, all of them canceled out in the final result and gave us a particular number, which is lambda nc to the power 2 n square. Okay. So, this is a configuration, presumably, in which the b and b tilde are, being, are zero. And so it obeys our original conjecture. The conjecture that uh, this, 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 this relationship has to be deformed. In fact, this tells us that the relationship has to be deformed, right? Because if we didn't have the deformation, we would get wrong answer. But it also tells us how it has to be deformed. Because the answer is coming out independent of parameters. It didn't depend on m tilde, it didn't depend on m. We could take those quantities and now take them to zero. Because we wanted the de you know this 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 quantity in the original theory, we take them all to zero, get an answer independent of m tilde and m. This deformation just works out. Okay, so this is the first indication. I'm not sure about the two. Somebody should do this more carefully. And but maybe the answer is the deformation has a two. The number didn't matter. Okay, so the important thing here is that we by 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 matching with low energy, we've deduced that the classical relationship must be deformed. Now, Cyborg in his paper has done more sensitive tests on configurations in which the B and B tilde are also turned on. Uh, just from symmetries, this is the only, you know, the only relationship you could have had. But he has checked also the B and B tilde term from, this, from this, this point of view. OK? So do you understand the logic of the matching? Logic was we turn on a superpotential, thereby flow to the low energy theory. Then turn on masses also in the low energy theory, and, in, and then compute what the low energy mesons are. But by equating superpotentials, compute what the high energy meson is. Thereby you have the full meson, and then check whether the meson matrix is as it should be. You know, is obeying this, con this constraint. Is this clear? The logic clear? The algebra, as you saw, was very horrible. But with uh, all your help, we managed to do it. And we, and we get it to work. OK. So already this suggests that this is the right deformation. OK? 
But now I'm going to tell you about an even more non-trivial check of this idea. And this even more non-trivial check of this idea comes from Toft anomaly cancellation. Diksha, you're looking unsatisfied. No, no, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, this even more non-trivial check comes from anomaly cancellation. Uh, sorry, anomaly matching. So let me tell you first of the logic of this check. Uh, maybe we'll have to actually go through the check next time. Um, see, so far we have already in our ana analysis used anomalies in quite an important way. But the way we use these anomalies was in a way a little crude. The way we use these anomalies was to check which apparently classical symmetries, which, sym which transformations that classically looked like symmetries were actually symmetries of the theory. In other words, the anomalies we looked at were global gauge gauge. Okay? Now, one can also compute anomalies that are of the form global, global, global. What is the logical role of such anomalies? You know, in, some, in an early course in quantum the field theory, you read about anomalies as being things that look like symmetries but are not. Suppose you have um, a global, global, global anomaly. What that means is the following. Were you to turn on a background gauge field coupling to some global symmetry, if there is a global, global, global anomaly, the other global symmetry would become anomalous. So suppose we have a background gauge field for global 2, and we're looking at whether global 1 is symmetry, is symmetry or not. And we're looking at the anomaly, which is global 1, global 2, global 2. Then, were, if this is non-zero, it would tell you that were you to turn on a background gauge field coupling to global 2 symmetry, global 1 would no longer be conserved. This looks like a pretty esoteric statement, right? It tells you about how global 1 symmetry charge conservation would be violated in the presence of a background gauge field coupling to global 2. Okay? And it is a pretty esoteric thing, but it's a very useful thing. The reason it's useful is that this anomaly is sort of RG invariant. Meaning it can be deduced both from the UV description and from the effective IR description. Okay. And one way of un understanding this is the follow, is as follows. Suppose we had a global 1, global 2, global 2 anomaly. This means that if I turn on a background gauge field for global 2, global 1 is no longer concerned. But now I add another sector decoupled from my original theory. Okay? Which is concocted so as to have the reverse global 1, global 2, global 2 anomaly. They just make up some new field theory. And add it. These are decoupled field theories, so the dynamics, they don't talk to each other. Now, the global 1, global 2, global 2 anomaly is totally zero by construction. If it's zero, then global 1 is conserved in the background of some global 2 gauge field. And that is just true as a, an absolute conservation statement. So it would be true in the UV as well as the IR. Now, Toft made this argument uh, and added the following even more dramatic twist to it. Said, in fact, you can weakly gauge global 2. This is possible because global, uh, uh, sorry, weakly gauge global 1. And global 2, let's say. Let's, say, let's, 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 um, let's weakly gauge, let's say. Um, yeah, let's, let's weakly gauge them both. Okay? Let's weakly gauge them both. Okay. Now, suppose these global symmetries are now in the presence of this, this decoupled theory is weakly gauged. Because in the UV there were no anomalies, the gauging is consistent. But, but if it's consistent, it's consistent. Therefore, there should be no anomalies, even the IR. 
You see, because if you you have a um, uh, you have a current coupling to a gauge, and that current is not conserved, the gauge theory is just not consistent. Okay, so from every description of it, the consistency should be manifest. And therefore, the anomalies when com computed in some effective IR description must match those of the UV description. So that continues to cancel the uh, spectator sector. Actually, this gauging is not needed for the argument. It's just that uh, something is conserved, something is a genuine symmetry in the presence of background gauge field is an absolute statement and will continue to be true both in the IR theory and the UV theory. Okay? So this was this qualitative type of argument given by Toft. People have put equations to it. Okay? And the argument is correct. So you see, global, global, global anomalies may seem like they are answering a pretty esoteric question. What happens to one symmetry if you turn on a background field for another one? Often we're not really interested in turning on these background fields. However, what's re what for our current purposes is really important about these anomalies is that they're computable both in the UV description as well as in the IR description. You have to get the, give the same answer in both descriptions. They are gene variant objects. See, this is true of anomalies in general. You know, one way of thinking of them makes them sound like UV quantities because they're quantities, things that cannot, you know, symmetries that are violated because of some regulator effect. That makes it sound UV. However, their consequences are entirely IR. They lead to violation of some charge conservation, which is a very IR effect. So anomalies are something that live both in the UV and the IR. And this is one of the main uses of anomalies. That a UV description can compute, can be used to compute the anomaly. If you have an effective IR description, that can also be used to compute the anomaly. So for instance, QCD, if you had such a, uh, such a question in QCD, I'm not saying that it is exactly one, but the, the, you know, in the UV, QCD is described in terms of quarks and gluons. In the IR, it's described in terms of pions and maybe glue balls. If you knew, if you had a conjectured description for pions and glue balls, that's like an independent description, okay? And that description should produce all the same anomalies that the UA description has. So these are in terms of different degrees of freedom, and yet it has to produce the same anomalies. This is the essence of this anomaly matching business, right? You could have an RG flow taking you from one theory to another. The, in the IR, you may be working in completely different degrees of freedom. And yet the anomalies have to be the same. Is this clear? OK? Uh, when you said uh, you, this cancellation happens between the original theory and the spectator se sector, that means that the total charge is conserved. Conserved. But then how are you saying that we can gauge just the? No, we gauge the whole thing, including spectator. So the spectators put in for that so that you can gauge it. Okay, but you see, we're gauging very weakly in this gauge version. So these two sectors talk to each other very little. Weakly. Meaning, you uh, uh, gauge it with a, a gauge coupling equals zero. Very small. Or you, I don't know, you arrange for some higgsing of the gauge field or something like that. Right? I don't think the gauging does much. Think of it just as a global symmetry. Because then these two sectors are totally decoupled. Okay, great. Okay, so now, I know we, we're late, just four minutes more, we'll, we'll stop. Now, what do we want to use this idea for? We want to use this idea for the following. You see, if it's true, okay, if it's true that um, this deformed manifold correctly gives the manifold a vacuum, then it also gives a prediction for what the low energy degrees of, th of freedom of the theory are. By the Goldstone idea, that if you have a manifold of vacuum, then you have massless fields corresponding to motion on that manifold of vacuum. These are massless chi chiral multiplets and therefore come with massless fermions. So we have an effective IR description in terms of a sigma model. Oh. 
a tangent space of a sigma model. Okay? And that effective IR description must produce all the same anomalies as the UV description. But we have to be careful. We can only compare anomalies for symmetries that are not broken. And at a generic point on our manifold, we break all the global symmetries of the theory because M and B have webs. Okay? However, there are points on the manifold where large symmetry subgroups are preserved. Let's look at two such, which give especially non-trivial checks. The first of these is this. You see, our equation was det M minus B B tilde lambda to the part 2 NC. Okay? Let's take a point on this manifold where B is equal to 0 and B tilde is equal to 0. Okay? Um, but M is equal to um, uh, M is equal to let's say is, is proportional is lambda squared times identity. I've chosen identity because identity preserves of the SUNC times SUNC of the UV theory. It preserves one the diagonal subgroup. Okay? So in this configuration, we have SUNC times SUNC uh, preserved. We also have the flavor symmetry that acts in opposite ways on Q and Q tilde are preserved. Because that will conserve this. Okay? That, that U1, we have that U1 uh, preserved. Okay? And uh, uh, there is some R symmetry which we can talk about. We'll discuss all this in detail next class. Okay? Similarly, there's another configuration in which M is just zero, but B is equal to B tilde is equal to lambda to the power NC. This is another configuration in which a great deal, you know, both the non-abelian flavor symmetries, SU, NC1 times SU, NC2 are preserved. Okay? Uh, some of the U1s are broken. We'll discuss all this in detail next time. But you see, there are points on this moduli space where a great deal of the symmetry is preserved. At those points, we have to look at the tangent space of the manifold at those points. The massless fields come from the tangent space at those points. Okay? The anomaly is produced by these massless fields at the tangent space of points that preserve a certain symmetry. Must produce the anomalies produced by these, tan these tangent spaces must be the same as what you get from the UV theory for those preserved symmetries. Okay? This is a pretty striking and non-trivial check. Notice it's a check that would even be hard to formulate if the theory was not, if the manifold was not smoothened out. Because if you're working around uh, the neighborhood of a singular point, there's no tangent space to it. Okay, so the fact that we've got a smooth manifold allows us to do all these checks. Okay? And next class, I will do these checks for you and show you that they work. Okay.